Good morning. Welcome to the Field Crops Team Virtual Breakfast for August 15th. I'm Christina Carell and I'm going to be your host this morning. Today's speakers, we have Dr. Kurt Thalen who's going to talk to us about industrial hemp management. And then later we will continue on with our MSU's um, climatologist who will be discussing what we're what we've seen and what we're going to be expecting, and that's Dr. Jeff Andreessen. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kurt. Okay, thank you, Christina, and good morning, everybody. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about industrial hemp. Uh, at Michigan State, we have a, a team of uh, people actually working on the hemp project with expertise ranging from uh, extension, agronomy, weed science, uh, plant pathology, entomology, so forth. Uh, so that's uh, the approach that we've taken uh, rather than have any one individual working on it. And as you can see that, uh, so I've got a, quite a few co-authors this morning on uh, the presentation. I'll start off with some of the information resources that are available on the left of the screen. If you're, you have, uh, if you're joining us with a computer this morning, you'll see the, there's a MDARD website. Uh, it's very helpful on the regulatory side of industrial hemp. Uh, it's a new crop, and uh, even though it has been delisted uh, from controlled substances, there's still some regulation involved uh, through the state program. And uh, MDART has a very helpful website, and I'll mention it again later because they've just posted as of August 12th the requirements for sampling and submitting samples for uh, THC evaluation. Then the other plug I'll make is for our uh, extension bulletin, MSU E3402. And uh, that has uh, all the information you need as far as how to produce the crop. Uh, we certainly don't have time uh, in the 15 minutes we have this morning to go through all the production aspects. So we'll keep today's talk kind of in tradition with the other virtual breakfasts on how, basically looking at how the crop looks this year. So that's what I'll uh, be be primarily focusing on. So for starters, uh, what is industrial hemp? Uh, it is, of course, a plant that uh, is of the same genus and species as uh, what's also known as marijuana. What really separates it is that it's a plant that's been bred not to have uh, the THC in concentrations where it's going to, uh, to impact you. And uh, so by legal definition, it's less than 0.3% of the uh, tetrahydra cannabinol in the plant. Uh, it's a broadleaf plant, uh, gets pretty tall, it's fairly competitive, taproot, and you'll see some examples of all these. Uh, it's photo period sensitive, uh, wind pollinated, uh, which can cause some concerns for cross pollination. We'll talk a little bit about that also. Uh, and the plants are indeterminate, uh, meaning that they'll continue to flower and produce seed uh, over a period of time. So I'll start uh, by talking about some of the varieties uh, and really the variety that you're going to choose is going to be dependent on what your end use is going to be. Uh, hemp is a crop that has lots and lots of uses. The, the primary ones are fiber, uh, then for the seed grain and the seed oil, and then for uh, non-seed oils, which is where the cannabinoids are stored in the plant. Uh, just by way of definition, cannabinoids is a chemical class that's fairly unique to cannabis uh, plants. There are a few other species that produce, produce cannabinoids, but it's uh, mainly in the cannabis uh, uh, genus. And it's really, it's, uh, it's the evolutionary biologists think it was really designed as uh, kind of an insecticide that the plant produces to ward off uh, insect pests. But uh, humans, of course, also have a uh, metabolic pathway that, uh, that will accept uh, cannabinoids. So just, uh, just some quick look here. Uh, again, this is all the data I show you today is preliminary observations. Uh, we generally like to have multi-year data before we make any recommendations, and we don't even have, obviously, a full year in yet. So you'll have to take anything we show with kind of a grain of salt. Uh, but just some overall observations, and this is from uh, the grad student that we have working on the project, Ryan Farmer. Farmer. Uh, he's doing some work with a multi-state project, variety trial type of a project. Uh, we didn't get really good stands uh, this year. Overall, it's been a tough spring for everybody, uh, 
Uh, this was planted at 30 pound live seed rate. Uh, as I mentioned, it's multi-state. In Michigan, we'd probably be uh, recommending closer to a 45 pound rate, which is what uh, we have in our Upper Peninsula site. That's not part of this particular uh, trial. And we recommend uh, that you have uh, anywhere from nine to 13 plants per foot for grain production or 23 plants per foot for fiber production. And of course, planting date and soil conditions will, will always uh, affect your final stands. Uh, this is sent by James D. Decker up at our uh, Upper Peninsula uh, trial we have up there. And yes, uh, we think we can grow uh, hemp successfully that far north. And you can see uh, some of the data that he has there as far as plant heights and different types of variety that's, that he's growing. Uh, down at KBS, uh, Brooke Wilk has a, a demonstration crop, kind of using it as somewhat of a, uh, more or less of a cover crop. Uh, he did some work with no seeding. He was able to get it in on May, May 31st. Uh, one of the aberrations that we've noticed this year with the late planting that we've done, some, some of the plants began flowering very early. Uh, it's photo period sensitive, so if you're, it's going to be, uh, actually it's the period of darkness that the plants measure, but that's going to be what triggers uh, flowering. So it's important to have the right variety selected for your particular latitude uh, when, you're, when you're planting. Uh, he's actually had some uh, mature seeds present uh, earlier this month down there at, uh, in the southwest. Uh, also in the southwest part of the state here, uh, Eric Anderson has done a, uh, this would be a non-USDA funded uh, kind of a demonstration project that he's got going, working more with what we would call like a horticultural model uh, for production of these plants. That would be conducive to the CBD production, although I'll talk a little bit later on as a, a new, even a CBD or the plant oil uh, production system that more re closely resembles uh, a what I would call a row crop or a field crop system that's being developed down in Kentucky for producing CBD. But this is some of the uh, of his uh, work that he's just doing on a demonstration basis here. We talked about the taproot. Uh, if you have a screen, you'll see how he did encounter some hard pan. And you can see the crop is sensitive to that with a with a tap root. So these didn't root very deep. These are male plants that he removed. Also seeing some um, start of some disease. Or he did make a note also. It's kind of hard to keep up with removing the male plants, which in a horticultural type system that's emphasizing the CBD production, you generally like to do that because uh, that helps the concentration of the cannabinoids. And CBD is one of the. They say there's probably around a hundred cannabinoids and their metabolites present in the plant at any one time. As far as the pest management uh, side, uh, Aaron Burns is working on that uh, on campus. Uh, currently, there are no herbicides approved in the U.S. for the management of weeds. Uh, in Canada, I believe Assure is for uh, grass control, but uh, here in the States, uh, we are not able to use uh, pesticides other than under a university type trial. So we try to grow them uh, with cultural type practices to uh, basically outcompete the weeds. Just a quick look at some of her observations this year. Uh, I mentioned Assure is being approved in Canada. Nice clean plot there. Uh, she's also looked at some other products. You can see a little bit of uh, uh, damage there from some post uh, emergence applications. Uh, but also this untreated control looks pretty good too. And uh, hemp has showed if you can get that good stand early on, uh, it'll do very well as far as out competing weeds. If you don't get that good early stand, uh, you're going to be in for a struggle uh, the whole year. As far as insects, uh, Chris Defonso is working on our, our team on those, and she's had a few observations. Uh, we do know uh, we see insects, uh, quite a range of insects on, on hemp, foliators, spores, sucking pests. Bud and flower protection is going to be the most important if you're in, into the, uh, the CBD. Uh, currently, no insecticides are labeled for hemp. What she's seen is a uh, Japanese beetle. You can see in the picture there. They uh, don't appear to be feeding excessively to the point where they're going to cause damage, much the way they are on other plants. Also, uh, thanks, by the way, Chris, for that photo. Uh, corn earworm 
feeding. Also, she has a picture there of some uh, some damage uh, to a plant there from corn ear, earworm. James Decker sent these pictures up in the UP, and you can see quite a range of different pests here that are active on the plant. As far as the disease, the first years, it's kind of a honeymoon period for any new crop. You don't have a lot of diseases built up specific for any one crop, but we do know uh, that there's sensitivity to white mold. Uh, so at some point, that builds up in your particular fields, uh, it could be a problem. And much like the herbicides and the insecticides, the crop is so new that there currently aren't any fungicides that are registered for use. And here from uh, James up in the, at uh, Uprec, there are some lesions appearing, some discoloration. So we know that uh, we will have some susceptibility there. Uh, I mentioned earlier the website that MDARD has that's very helpful for the regulatory aspects. They, as of August 12th, they just posted the required THC sampling procedures. So if you do have hemp in 2019, uh, that's what you'll need to look up and follow that. It's, it's a fairly easy read. I read through it as far as uh, regulations go. It's a fairly easy read anyway. Uh, five pages long. It covers in pretty good detail on how to go about sampling and how uh, to submit those samples. Just briefly here is kind of a summary here. Some of the things that we've noticed in 2019, uh, that's a new crop, we're all learning from it. Uh, Cross-pollination concerns. Uh, even in the Upper Peninsula, we had uh, concerns raised about pollen uh, escaping from industrial hemp that's going to possibly contaminate uh, marijuana, med medicinal marijuana crops. And we don't worry too much about the seed unless you're saving the seed, but it also can affect the concentration of the cannabinoids because once a, a female flower is fertilized, uh, it really slows down in the production of the cannabinoids. It's, it's kind of uh, reached its end goal, so it's stopping to, to produce the, the protective uh, uh, cannabinoids. But that, uh, it's a kind of a degree by degree thing, one flower at a time. So it's not going to completely knock out or lower those concentrations to, uh, to zero from long distance. Uh, but it can be a concern if you're within, let's say, a, a mile or so of a, a production facility for medicinal uh, marijuana. The flowering at three to four weeks and some varieties that weren't w real well suited for our latitude uh, sort of surprised us. Also, we've been seeing that kind of a, a mixed bag of minor pests and diseases, nothing that's knocked out our whole stands yet. Uh, the ability to compete with weeds, uh, that was kind of a favorable observation, but again, that's only if you have a good stand. If you don't have a good stand, you're in for a battle. Uh, then I wanted to make mention uh, this, there's, there is emerging down in, uh, primarily in uh, Kentucky, there's companies that are working that are very similar to the way mint is grown in Michigan, where you basically mow and chop the complete crop. Uh, then you extract that under steam. Then you, uh, with that extraction, you're getting the oil. And then you, from that oil, you can do further extractions to isolate any particular cannabinoid that you are interested in, in getting. And with that system, they don't rug out uh, the male, plot, male plants. Uh, it's, it's very much a production-oriented uh, field crop model versus the horticultural model where you plant a wider road spa spacings to kind of encourage that branching. You do a lot of hand labor. You're har harvesting only the, the female flower structures and then extracting from those. So there's a couple different systems out there for that because I know currently that's where a lot of the interest is at. Uh, then wrapping up here, my time is up. Uh, I see then again, just a reminder on these information resources. You can uh, just, if you're like me, you'll let Google, if you Google MDARD Industrial Hemp, you'll get to the MDARD site. And if you Google MSU Industrial, MSUE Industrial Hemp Production, you'll get to our uh, production bulletin. So with that, Christina, I'll uh, turn it over you, to you if you have questions or. Thank you, Kurt. Yes, we have a couple quick questions. Um, one of them is, when can we expect pesticides to be registered for use for industrial hemp? Well, the, the registration process is a long one. Uh, through uh, IPM, you can sometimes get emergency declarations. 
So that is much quicker. That's on a season by season basis. Uh, but I wouldn't expect uh, at least any of the preventive type pesticides coming along real soon. Uh, it's all going to depend. It's, it's economically based. If a company feels they can get that economic return, they'll, they'll uh, go forward with that registration process, which is long and expensive, generally speaking. Thank you. Is there a soil texture that is preferred for hemp production, or will it grow in any of our soil types? Uh, hemp, I would classify it as uh, liking the finer things in agronomy. It'll do a lot better on uh, soils that uh, you can grow good corn on. Uh, it will grow in more uh, marginal soils, but uh, it, 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 the production will be severely limited in those soils as well. So it, uh, I, I kind of like to target it after corn. If you've, if you've got good soils for corn, you've got good soils for hemp. Can we get the bulletin online or do we have to order it? Uh, you can get it online. Uh, if you Google that uh, MSUE industrial hemp production, it'll take you to where you can get a download. Okay. You, know, you can just view it online also. All right. Thank you. Kurt, we do have one question that came in, and it was from Karen Renner, and she would like you to explain the dioecious versus monoecious varieties and what that means as type of production of hemp. Dioecious uh, plants are plants that are either male or female, so you have the, the flowering parts on a single plant for any particular gender. Uh, whereas the uh, most plants are monoecious where they have both male and female flower parts on the same plant. And with industrial or hemp, or if you're going to be growing it for any of the cannabinoids uh, or even medicinal marijuana, that's concentrated in the female flower parts of that plant. So then if you're a producer of that, you want to try to uh, have only female plants in your field because once, as I, I mentioned, uh, once that pollination occurs, that particular flower shuts down the cannabinoid process and focuses on making that seed, bringing that seed to uh, maturation. Uh, so that's part of the, and there are, uh, cannabis has both uh, uh, monoecious and dioecious species out there. You saw some of the variety tables that I put up there, those differences. And if you have a system where you're producing the cannabinoids, you really want to have the dioecious one so you can remove all those male plants and then keep those flower buds from uh, being pollinated. And there's other processes too about feminizing seed where you can actually induce the production of pollen and female plants and then those offspring are typically highly female uh, but that's probably subject for uh, another whole another whole uh, virtual breakfast I guess. All right thank you. So with that I have a couple of other announcements or reminders to go ahead and fill in your chat the survey in the chat box if you have not done that yet. There also is delayed planting resources that are timely. It's just not resources for the beginning of our growing season. We are keeping that information updated with things that farmers can expect as we go through the harvest season. And then next week, uh, Dr. Manny Singh will be talking about silage disease and quality management. So with that, if there's nothing else, have a good day. And I hope it rains. <laughs>